Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, first ever reading uh, by the winners of, by the first ever winners of the Wyndham Campbell Literature Prizes. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Yale Art Gallery tonight. Um, we're really thrilled to have all of the prize winners here in this room. Everyone is going to do a brief 10-minute reading. Um, we're going to be reading from all three categories, fiction, nonfiction, and drama. And the idea behind this reading, I think, was really to allow you to hear the actual physical human voices of all these writers that we're celebrating here this week and to have those voices echo off of one another uh, in, in ways that there are, they've already been doing throughout the last couple of days in various talks and panel discussions that have been going on. Uh, and, and we thought it would be a really great opportunity to have you hear them reading from their great artwork uh, uh, and, and having that uh, be the center of the evening. So. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce all of our prize winners and uh, give them a hand. Naomi Wallace in drama. Johnny Steinberg in nonfiction. Tom McCarthy in fiction. Terrell Alvin McCraney in drama. Jeremy Scahill in nonfiction. <laughs> Zoe Wickham in fiction. <laughs> Stephen Adley Girgis in drama. <laughs> Adina Hoffman in nonfiction. <laughs> and James Salter in fiction. And that will be the reading order this evening, so please welcome Naomi Wallace. Um, we're going to read a very short play called One, F One Short Sleep. And this uh, wonderful actor has agreed to do it with me. I'm doing the stage direction. This is Ismail Khalidi, playwright and actor. And the play takes place after 2006. A young Lebanese man, Bashir, early 20s, dressed casually, is digging a hole in the ground with a shovel. He digs at different times during the scene, but often breaks for periods while speaking to us. At the end of her body, yes, at the end of her body, there are six spinning fingers called spinnerets which make a spinning machine so intricate nothing can match it. These fingers, or spinning tubes, having tiny holes at the end of each one through which spills the thread. Spills, I like that word. And I say spills as a spider's web is actually liquid until it comes into contact, into contact with the air. On the feet are tiny claws to guide the thread, three different kinds, and the pilots. Let me tell you about the pilots. When they are very young, they climb to the highest points they can find and then turn to face the wind. And there are various kinds of wind. Today, for instance, is the kind of wind that sh the shapes of jets leave behind. When the jets disappear, their silver hangs in the air. Their cold fuel floats like blue threads over the city. Nothing to do with beauty. Everything to do with precision. For the spider then stands on tiptoe, raises its opis thesoma, its abdomen or end, as high as it can in the air and sends out a stream of silk from its youthful spinnerets. The air takes up the thread and the spinner pays out its line until it's long enough to tug the spider and hold its weight. Then the spider lets go and pilots the craft through the breeze. And the spider is not at the mercy of the wind, but can haul in its thread or lengthen it to rise and fall in the air. This tiny, perfect aircraft may travel long distances, even out to sea, perhaps to end up on foreign soil. Or, if unlucky, to spin its thread on a wave, 
away. That's how they came for us. Wave after wave, the pilots covering the ground, covering the ground with four, covering the ground with four million, covering the ground with four million cluster munitions, covering our streets, our roofs. The bomblets lay their hard fruit in the broken road, and they were made not by God as the spiders are, but by hands, soldering, cutting, screwing, polishing, testing. And I studied, I studied up until the moment of spinnerets, the spiders and their wonders. Of all the studies I could have chosen at Beirut University, I chose entomology, because spiders have eight eyes, arranged in two rows on the front of their heads. Eight eyes, imagine it eight opportunities to witness an event from a different angle. It was summer in the year 2006. The jets took off out just outside Tel Aviv and Haifa, perhaps even Jerusalem. And my enemy, my brother, the pilot, pulled the night smooth and tight across our garden while my sister Ghada examined an ant on her finger. She held the creature up to my face. Get lost, I said. He holds up the blade of the shovel and talks to it as though it were his sister. Get lost, Ghada. I'm reading. I have exams tomorrow, little girl. You know nothing about spiders, and soon I will know everything. We were cruel to each other, my eight-year-old sister and I, because we loved each other absolutely. I was turning the page of my book on spiders. The sirens were sounding. The leaflets were dropping. The kindness of warnings. You are ordered to evacuate your villages immediately. We had no weapons in our home. But, ah, the wonder, the wonder of those tiny spinning tubes of the liquid of contact with air. It was the second raid. My mother couldn't get back home. She was with her mother safe across town. My dear father was on our roof. His legs were at the bottom of the stairs. And Ghada had an ant at the end of her body. At the end of her body on the end of her finger, and she was singing or weeping, singing or weeping, and I told her to stop, but she just kept on. Namal is gheer, namal is gheer, Allah aayish feek. Little ant, little ant, God lives in you. Take me to your home, the sky is no longer blue. I said, he speaks to the shovel blade again. Shut up, sing about spiders, you stupid girl. Not ants, not ants. Ants can't be pilots. The noise of jets is silence until they are done. And when they are done, grace closes its door. I was going to be an expert on insects. I read all the books in English. I knew the Latin names for silence, for silly girls, for the numbers that surround the number eight. The bomb that was falling towards our house, the bomb that was fabricated in Nevada or Wisconsin or Indiana, was dreamt into being through a good day's labor and a good day's work. And then we were hit. I wish I had been born a spider. Chelicera. Epigastric furrow, spigots, such eloquent names for small pieces of the body. And to have eight eyes, eight eyes to see the world from different vantage points in that half second before death, when the sky is clear as cold weather, when the sun is tiny in our throats and we kneel at our graves but cannot warm the dirt, cannot gather our pieces again, nor explain the absence of the love of strangers whom we have never met only what they have touched. My sister Ghada and I, we couldn't hold it together. No, we couldn't hold it together. Our bodies went in different directions. We were dispersed. Yes, we kicked the bucket. We bit the dirt. We battened down the hatches. No, that last one is wrong. Maybe croaked. He now puts down the shovel and speaks sharply to the grave he's been digging. Oh, it wasn't like that, was it? Hey, I've been to university, sister. I know a thing or two. You've got no sense of humor, kid. Then you tell me. What were we like when we died? He listens to his sister's answer for some moments. You are a brat. 
He listens again. All right, all right. Ghada says she has eight eyes. Even though she didn't go to university, even though she never studied spiders. And she says she saw eight things. One, that we were both of us standing side by side, two clear armfuls of water. Two, that when the bomb dropped down into us, our water leapt from its hold. Three, that the wind caught us as our liquid made contact with the air. Four, that we paid out our lines. Five, we paid out our lines of gossamer thread with the time we had left to us. Six, that there was a tug at our lines. Seven, so we let ourselves go. What is the eighth thing you saw, Ghada? Huh. She says she won't tell me because I raised my voice. He sits on the edge of the grave and examines his work. I've made a good hole, though not perhaps just for us, not just for myself and Ghada. All right. You can have one of my special ink pens if you tell me, but just one. With the eighth eye, my sister says she did not see anything. With the eighth eye, in that moment, she heard a song. How can you hear with your eyes, silly? Oh, that's how. Though I am forbidden to tell you, uh, yet. But I can tell you what she says she heard. Spider, spider, little boy. Oh, sorry, my, my ears are no longer so good from the blast. It's not boy. Uh, I try again. Ankabut, Ankabut, Saeed is Ghir, Mean Aish fi Ayunik. Spider, spider, little joy, who lives in your eyes? It was so long ago, it was just yesterday. Eight times I saw love. Eight times love saw me. The end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Johnny Steinberg. Thanks. I'm going to read from a forthcoming book um, called A Man of Good Hope. Assad Abdullah sits opposite me at a table in the company gardens. Around us, elderly white men are playing chess. My notebook is open on the table, my pen in my hand. I'm asking Assad about the Quran district of Mogadishu, where he spent the first seven or eight years of his life. He says he remembers so little. It doesn't matter, I say. Instead of trying to remember, just tell me what comes into your head when you think of Mogadishu. The oddest thought comes to me. He's wearing a body-hugging yellow hoodie and skinny blue jeans. And in this tight attire, he seems to me not just tall and thin, but elongated. Each part of him, his nose, his cheeks, his palms, and his fingers, his torso, appear to have been ever so caringly stretched. The result is elegant. It occurs to me that he is sitting at Cape Town's point of origin. The gardens around us were planted 358 years ago, almost to the day. Here is Assad on very old ground, while he himself is so new and so decidedly unwelcome. In his slender fingers is a twig. I think he picked it up while we strolled up from the library. Now he snaps it in half and draws it to his nose. His eyebrows rise with surprise, and he smells it again. Amazing, he says. From the moment I saw it lying on the ground, I knew what the smell would remind me of. And he begins to tell me how he made ink. He was seven years old, he thinks, a student at a madrasa, preparing the charcoal mixture into which he would dip his pen in order to copy out the Quran. To bind the ink, he says, you need the sap from an agrig tree. You snap over a branch with pinched fingers, and with pinched fingers tease out the juice, allowing it to drip into the charcoal and water. While stirring the mixture, you absentmindedly put your fingers to your nose. You breathe in deeply. Ah. The smile on his face is wistful and intense, and I think that I have an inkling of where he has gone. He knows that I am still here, that at the table next to us men are playing chess, but he is also elsewhere, and he is savoring it for he understands that it can only last a few seconds. He has reeled back more than 20 years, 
with the twig he has found in the company gardens, he is reliving a forgotten high, for it is clear from the expression on his face that the sap of the agreeg is narcotic. I feel a whim rising. I know that if I think about it, even for a moment, I'll find a reason to back off, so I don't think about it. The man who idly snaps open a twig and is transported back so vividly, so powerfully to another world is a man about whom I ought to write a book. There and then I tell him that I will give him 7,000 rand to start his new business. A week after giving him the money, I go and see him in his shack in Tin Town on the outskirts of Cape Town. He has cut a hole in one of his walls and covered it with a wire meshing. Behind it is a stool, and behind that, ceiling high shelves filled with cigarettes and crisps and tinned food and bags of Millie Meal. I do not share with him at first what I am hoping for. I begin to go to see him twice a week. We sit on his bed and talk for an hour or so, then I leave. At the end of my third visit, I ask whether he would consider the prospect of my writing a book about his life. I tell him that were he to agree to this, I would ask for a lot of his time, two mornings a week, say, maybe for as long as a year. I would travel to the places he has lived, or, or at least to those to which travel is possible, and I would try to find people who once knew him. I wish to see the houses in which he slept and to walk the streets he walked. When the book is published, I say I will offer him 25% of royalties. I give him a sense of the sort of sum this would probably turn out to be. I tell him not to answer me now, but to give it thought. Driving back to Cape Town on the motorway, my feelings are mixed. I'm excited. Back at the University of Cape Town, I will not even stop in at my office. I will go straight to the library and take out four or five of the most reputable books on Somalia, and I will bury myself in them. I also feel uneasy. He is a man in need. I am certain that he will say yes. And true, I've extended him a lifeline, but I've also helped him open a cash business in a lawless place. His life, was, his life is worth much less than it was two weeks ago. I find myself making a mental note. I must ask him where Cape Town Somalis bury their dead. I'd thought that the 7,000 rand would free him to talk to me. One can hardly ask a man who scrounges daily for work to take off two days a week to sift through his memories. But his new shop brings to our meetings troubles of a different ilk. His wife can work the counter while he speaks to me, but she knows little English, and no Gosa or Afrikaans. And so Assad, increasingly adept at all three, must be on hand. Sometimes I accompany him to Mitchell's Plain Town Center or to Belleville, or to a chore he must do in the center of town. But on the whole, he, we must conduct our interviews in shouting distance of his business. At first, we meet in his shack. I sit on the edge of his bed, and he on a plastic chair. But he is uncomfortable with the arrangement. He fiddles incessantly with his hands. At the slightest sound outside, he cocks his head and listens. An hour into our second interview, he has had enough. He tells me briskly that we cannot meet in his shack any longer and insists that we move to my car. And so day after day, that is where we meet. I sit in the driver's seat, he in the passenger seat, my, no my, my notebook passing between us as I record his testimony in shorthand, and he draws pictures of the scenes that he describes. I am parked parallel to his shack, no more than a meter or two from the mesh-covered hall through which his wife serves his customers. Each person who comes to buy from him brushes against my car door. He tells me that he wants it this way because his shack is too small, but it isn't. It's a perfectly comfortable space in which to talk, far more convivial, in fact, than a car. I wonder what his real reasons are and why he wishes to keep them concealed. It comes to me slowly as our time together stretches into a rhythm and as the rhythm begins to emit meaning. More bluntly, it comes to me once I imbibe the bizarreness and the perversity of our meetings. I am a citizen of my country, and the many strangers around me are aware of this. One of them might choose to shoot a bullet into my head, but he knows that a machinery will kick into motion and people will come looking for him. I and those around me are in an orbit together. We are all aware of the rules. Assad does not move within this orbit. He stands outside of it, for the rules do not apply to him. His shop fills with cash every day, and he knows that his neighbors know that were somebody to shoot him in the head and take his money, the machinery of state would stutter reflexively into motion and then grind to a halt. I come to see that this knowledge shapes his life. In his every decision, the imperative to be free tussles with the imperative to be safe. On his shoulders rests the incessant burden of dodging his own murder. It is our third week together. We are sitting in my car talking. Turn on the ignition, he says. I look at him. A moment ago, he was deep in childhood memory, his head bowed, his hand running habitually over the dashboard. Now he is sitting bolt upright, and his eyes are fixed on my rearview mirror. 
I turn around. Don't, he says. Just start the ignition. I obey. Then I adjust my side mirror to see what he sees. A couple of hundred meters back, three young men, their hoodies low over their eyebrows, are walking towards us. I'm not afraid. I'm certain that they will soon turn left or right and head down another street. There are simply three shack settlements, uh, shack settlement residents going about their business. After all, everybody under a certain way, age wears a hoodie. Assad uh, lies neatly folded among the clothes in his shack. We wait. I begin to feel Assad's fear, as if it is a virus, as if it's jumped off him and sunk into my skin and is now coursing through my veins. This moment is so very productive. While a part of him is in my blood, I can understand. I can know why he insists on meeting in my car. More important, I know the calculations he has made when he allowed me into his life. You get scared every time I visit, I say. Yes, he replies, his eyes still fixed on the men behind us. You worry that a white man in a good car attracts men with guns and that you and your family are much more unsafe when I'm around. I worry about that so much, he says. And you insist that we meet in the mornings because that is when gangsters sleep, that's right. And you want to meet in the car so that you can see danger coming. In the shack, he replies, you can see nothing. The first you see of them is the gun in your face. By now, the three young men have walked right past us and we are watching their backs as they disappear. I turn off the ignition and pick up my pen and notebook. I do not want to tell him what else I think I now know. Saying it out loud would be dangerous. It would force us to examine our arrangements in its naked perversity, it would make it hard for us to continue. I'm imagining the calculations he has made. He very much wants to hang on to me, for I'm a person from the other side, a person who travels within the orbit of the law. Who knows when he might need such a person to come to his aid, perhaps tonight. But to keep our acquaintance, he must sit for hours alongside me and remember his past. Otherwise, I will lose interest and disappear. And he must, do this remembering, he must do this remembering in the vicinity of his home and family, for he cannot wander from his new business so often and for so long. Yet the routine of my recurring presence, he believes, is bound to attract men with guns. And so he juggles. He draws close to the parts of me that bring safety, while diluting as best he can the parts that bring danger. Hence my car. Between October 2010 and September 2011, we spend many hours there, while his internal eye peers into his childhood, the eyes on either side of his nose scan the street. Thanks. Tom McCarthy. Tom McCarthy. Thank you. I, I was going to read a, a passage from my first published book, Reminder, but I just attended a, a really excellent dialogue between Adina and, and, and Johnny and, uh, and, 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 uh, Jeremy. and Jeremy uh, <laughs> about, uh, so I'm really jet lagged, I can't, can't even remember my own name, um, about, about archives. And um, so I want to dialogue with that dialogue by reading a passage from um, my last book, C, um, about archives, which it seems to me always have to do with death. Um, so the year is 1913, and um, Serge and Sophie, brother and sister, are growing up on the family estate, Versoix, where their father runs a day school for, for the deaf, a day school for, for deaf children. Sophie, um, teenage Sophie, is a, a budding naturalist. She um, spends lots of time in her little lab on the estate extracting chemicals from plants and insects. She'll eventually poison herself with one of these chemicals. Um, their father, Simeon, is uh, an oralist. He teaches deaf children to speak. He's very much modeled on Alexander Bell, the inventor of the telephone's father, who, who did exactly this. Um, and part of his practice involves um, making recordings of, of these children as they learn to speak, partly as an aid and partly to kind of, uh, as a showcase, to show to, uh, to show off his achievements to, you know, prospective future parents of, of the day school. Um, Bodner is the name of the gardener who is mute. He has a, a deformed mouth. Oh, sorry. <coughs> the attic draws them back again and again. On rainy days, Serge and Sophie go there to fiddle with their fathers archive. 
He has stacks of old recordings, lamp blackened glass phonautograph plates and rolls of paper bearing scratch marks laid down by voices moaning from deaf bodies before either of them was born. Zinc master discs that cut in the final years of the last century and the first few of this appear to surge like coins of some exotic currency gone out of circulation, miniature round islands of arrested time. The surfaces of the zinc disc gives off discs give off a faint smell of beeswax, beeswax overlaid with some sharp chemical, chromic acid, Sophie tells him when she sees him wrinkling his nose at one, I've got a whole file of it in my lab. The cylinders they find beside these are formed entirely of wax, solid brown columns of the stuff whose smooth molded surfaces have been defaced by networks of engravings, strange meshed graffiti. Sophie and Serge can play these back thanks to an old Edison phonograph they find gathering dust among them. Selecting recordings at random, some are in labeled cardboard tubes, others are loose and unmarked. They slide the cylinder onto its mandrel and wait for the sound to trickle out. Most of the cylinders contain sequences of letters spoken out aloud repeatedly. B, 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 T, 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 S, 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 B. The voices, those of day school pupils, now alumni, manifest varying degrees of distortedness and atonality. The letters warp and morph as they progress. They gather certain rhythms, patterns of repetition or half repetition. Then just when it seems that there's a logic to their sequences, they break and relinquish them again. Serge and Sophie fall into the habit of putting on these recordings each time they're in the attic a mechanical background chorus to their various antics up there. Sometimes they play on a newer Berliner gramophone, not cylinders, but discs, exhibition plates their father had printed to showcase his students' ability to enunciate whole phrases or manage entire conversations. <coughs> After setting the disc gently on its turntable and cranking the Berliner's handle, they lead the needle down towards the narrow groove with the assiduousness of surgeons guiding knives back to incisions made on previous occasions, then return to their tasks while random mono dialogues model exchanges between infant shopkeepers and customers or passengers and train guards waft around them. Often, when a disc's come to its end, they let it run on playing and replaying the same stretch of silence. Silence which in fact is anything but silent, bursting as it is with a crackle and snap that conjures up for Serge the image of Bodner's deformed mouth opening and closing, many Bodner's mouths repeated side by side in rows that fill the attic's air and extend out beyond its roof and walls. Sometimes, while Sophie's busy copying plants, he props his head right up against the gramophone and watches the needle running through its trench, snagging and jumping constantly as though locked in hostile struggle with the furrow. The disc's made of a thick black material. It's shellac, Sophie informs him when he asks her one overcast Monday, made from secretions of the lac bug. The lac bug, Serge asks. What's it lacking? <laughs> <laughs> lac, no K, she, she says. I've got one of those in my lab as well. That's Rayner's voice. She's right. The disc he's come across this morning contains not phrases, but a passage of verse, which, spoken in a child's unbroken voice, seems strangely fitting for its newfound auditorium. Be not afeard. The aisle is full of noises, sounds, and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again.
The speaker, Rainer, spent a year or so at Versoir, a half-German boy who lost his hearing, then his life, to a cancer that developed in his ear. Serge saw the cancer one day. It was bulbous, like a set of roots buckling the organs in a chamber, upsetting the delicate architecture of its whirls and plateaus from beneath the skin's surface, while a moss-like coat overgrew it from above. Serge moves his head round and looks down into the Berliner's reproducing horn. Its brass has turned slightly green with time. The tube darkens as it narrows, then disappears into the sound box. Listening to Rainer, Serge thinks of entrances to caves and wells, of worm and fox holes, rabbit's burrows, and all things that lead into the earth. Thanks. Terrell, Terrell Alvin McCraney. Hmm. Let's see if I can navigate this. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I'll use that a little bit, like as an ambient sound catcher. Because <laughs> otherwise, I'll have to crouch down and get my eagle on, and you don't want that. Um, I'm going to read from two poor parts of the brother-sister plays, because there are three of them, and if I read all of them, we'd be here all night. So <clears throat> this one's from Marcus or the Secret of Sweet, um, which is, um, yeah, Marcus or the Secret of Sweet. Um, and this is Shanta Ayun talking to her best friend, Marcus, okay? You got that? Great. Are you sweet, Marcus? Marcus, stung, steps back. Marcus, it seems like you ain't never gonna confess it. Surely not to Osha. You know she like you, right? You know she think we best friends, better love us, but I ain't Osha, I'm just your friend. Are you sweet? I wonder where that comes from, calling somebody sweet. They must have passed it down to us down through slavery. Say the slave owners get pissed if they find out they slaves got the gay love. That means less children, less slaves, less. Think about it, Marcus. Where else it gonna come from? You think we just naturally mad at gay folk? Come on, imagine it. How they got down back then? Round here, niggas think they got it hard on the down low. What about back then? Two slaves, one dark, one light. One house, the other field, and they see each other one day. That sparkle in their eye, they begin to gather together when they can, hide their love from the light, dark kisses in the midnight hour with shackles for love bracelets and chains for promise rings. One night, Massa come up on them in their secret spot cause some handkerchief head other slave, jealous or holy, went and told, I seen so-and-so house and so-and-so field slave down together in the quarter, Marcus. You think slaves were snitching? Shantayun, hmm. nosiness is primordial, snitching inevitable. Master, tie and tether the lovers in front of everybody, talking about sending a message, placing weights on their private portions, lashing into the skin that they just held too tight moments ago, skin that was just kissed, now split oak from the lash of this white man's hands. And when the wounds are right, he run down and get some sugar, probably not probably pour it on. It don't sting as bad as salt, but it gets sticky and melt and sing in the southern sun. See, sweetness draw all the bugs and infection to the sores. Sweetness is harder to wash away. It become molasses in all the heat and blood and... Is that you, Marcus? You scared somebody gonna catch you? Are you sweet? So that's that one. <laughs> this next piece is from the brother size, and I warn you, has graphic language. Slam, since day one, 
Day one, you've been fucking up. And not just the other day when you were standing here looking all lost and stupid, all high on life, and the little bit of weed that the food lion won't find in your piss. Nah, hell nah, from day one, Aunt Eligua stopped taking us to church. I stopped going because I didn't want to go in the first place, but you kept getting up in the morning. You kept getting up every Sabbath and going down to the river to wash your fucking sins away. And everybody like, look at little size, taking up the cross with Jesus. Look at him, he only nine. Look at that devotion for Jesus. You should do like your brother Ogun. You should go down to the church like Tusi. You know what I wanted to say? Fuck that nigga and the church. I was jealous. I wanted to be you for a moment, little size. I wanted to be just like my little brother until me and Eligua found you using the money you were stealing from collection in a crap game. Yeah, yeah. And then everything turned. Everything turned, spun right round and landed on me. Everybody like, he only nine. If you would have been a better role model for him, Ogun, he would have acted like that. If I, if I, Aunt Eligua sealed it. That miserable old ass lady, she, she say, your mama would have been so disappointed in you, letting your brother go like that. Yemaya would have hated you failing her, Ogun, letting your brother go, letting you go. I let you go, I let you go, I, I got one image of my mama in my mind, and it fucks with me at night. She's standing there, out by the water. My mama's standing out, looking out, looking out towards the gulf, belly full of you. She's standing there, holding my hand tight, 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 just her and the water, us. That's all I got left of my mama, and, and you are in that picture. You are a part of all I got left, nigga. So I held on from that day. I gripped onto your ass and I pushed you through school. I forced you up and out. Whatever the fuck you, I did it. I burned my chance at anything so that I didn't leave you behind. I would run after you and ahead of you, always hoping that I could catch you or keep my grip on you or catch you before anyone else did. But no matter what I did, no matter if I thought you were fine, I thought you were going to be okay, somehow you would slip through and fuck up and fuck up and fuck up. And when you fucked up, somehow I fucked up. Somehow there is no escaping you. You say to me, you ain't never been in the pen. Nigga, whenever you fall, everybody look at me like I fucking pushed you. That is my life sentence. That's my lockdown. All my life, I've been carrying your sins on my back. And now you out there in a car that I souped up and popped off only so they can find you in it with a pound of fucking powder cocaine? What? Thank you. Jeremy Scahill. <laughs> uh, that 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 was uh, that was so amazing and intense. Um, this whole uh, experience of being here with all of you has just been surreal. Um, I'm sure m many of you had never heard of me. I hadn't heard of many of you. Um, but I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I am blown away uh, by each and every one of you, and I'm just really honored to be with you all. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I'm going to read uh, two little sections from my latest book, Dirty Wars, um, which tracks the rise of these elite covert U.S. military units that run uh, what the administration calls the targeted killing campaign around the world. Um, but in many ways, it, it really amounts to an assassination campaign. Uh, so the, there, are, there are about five or six stories woven together in the book. It's narrative nonfiction. There are characters in it. Um, and one of the main characters is uh, the American-born uh, cleric Anwar al Laki, who was the first US citizen um, targeted for assassination on orders of the president, uh, President Obama. Uh, without ha ever having been charged with a crime, and uh, never been in, he, had, he had never been indicted, um, 
and he was not on an active battlefield fighting against U.S. soldiers. So the case itself uh, is a test of the Constitution and, uh, and many other issues. Um, but the, part of the reason why this story fascinated me so much is that uh, the U.S. didn't just kill Anwar al -Laki. Two weeks after he was killed, uh, they also killed his 16-year-old son in a drone strike. And they've never explained why they killed the kid. He wasn't with his dad. He had no, nothing to do with terrorism. So the first section I'm going to read is just the prologue where I preview that part of the story. The young teenager sat outside with his cousins as they gathered for a barbecue. He wore his hair long and messy. His mother and grandparents had repeatedly urged him to cut it, but the boy believed it had become his trademark, and he liked it. A few weeks earlier, he had run away from home, but not in some act of teenage rebellion. He was on a mission. In the note he left for his mother before he snuck out the kitchen window as the sun was just rising and headed to the bus station, he admitted that he had taken money from her purse, $40 for bus fare, and for that he apologized. He explained his mission and begged for forgiveness. He said he would be home soon. The boy was the eldest child in his family, not just in his immediate family, which consisted of his parents and his three siblings, but in the large house they shared with his aunts and uncles and cousins and two of his grandparents. He was his grandmother's favorite. When guests visited, he would bring them tea and sweets. When they left, he would clean up after them. Once his grandmother twisted her ankle and went to the hospital for treatment. When she limped out of the treatment room, the boy was there to greet her and make sure she got home safely. You're a gentle boy, his grandmother always told him. Don't ever change. The boy's mission was simple. He wanted to find his father. He hadn't seen him in years, and he was afraid that if he didn't find him, he would be left only with blurred memories of his father teaching him to fish, to ride a horse, surprising him with an abundance of gifts on his birthday, taking him and his siblings to the beach or to the candy shop. Finding his father would not be easy. He was a wanted man. There was a bounty on his head, and he had narrowly escaped death more than a dozen times. That powerful forces in multiple countries wanted his father dead did not deter the boy. He was tired of seeing the videos of his father that painted him as a terrorist and an evil figure. He just knew him as his dad, and he wanted at least one last moment with him, but it didn't work out that way. Three weeks after he climbed out the kitchen window, the boy was outdoors with his cousins, teenagers like him, laying a picnic for dinner beneath the stars. It was then he would have heard the drones approaching, followed by the whiz of the missiles. It was a direct hit. The boy and his cousins were blown to pieces. All that remained of the boy was the back of his head, his flowing hair still clinging to it. The boy had turned 16 years old a few weeks earlier, and now he had been killed by his own government. He was the third US citizen to be killed in an operation authorized by the president in two weeks. The first was his father. So the second section that I wanted to read <clears throat> deals with an entirely different story in the book. Um, it's about the uh, President Obama's policy in Afghanistan of escalating night raids, where special operations forces kick down uh, doors of homes and they are looking for Taliban leaders or al-Qaeda leaders. And uh, many of these have ended up being uh, botched. And um, so this is from a section called One Night in Gardez. And Gardez is a is a uh, city in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, I investigated several botched night raids in which it was clear that innocent people had been targeted. None of them were more gruesome. None of them was more gruesome than what happened just outside of Gardez in Paktia province in February of 2010. On February 12, 2010, Mohammed Daoud Sharabuddin had much to celebrate. He was a respected police officer who had recently received an important promotion becoming head of intelligence in one of the districts of Paktia province in southeast Afghanistan. He was also the father of a newborn son. That night, Daoud and his family were celebrating the naming of the boy, a ritual that takes place on the sixth day of a child's life. The party was taking place at their compound in the village of Kataba, a short distance from Gardez, the capital of Paktia. There were two dozen people at their home for the celebration, along with three musicians. We invited many guests and had music, Daoud's brother-in-law, Mohammed Tahir, told me when I visited the family. During the party, people were dancing our traditional dance, the Atan. The Shirabuddin family was not ethnic Pashtun, the dominant, almost exclusive ethnicity of the Taliban. Their main language was Dari. Many of the men in the family were clean-shaven or wore only mustaches. They had long opposed the Taliban. 
Daoud, the police commander, had gone through dozens of US training programs, and his home was filled with photos of himself with American soldiers. Another family member was a prosecutor for the US-backed local government, and a third was the vice chancellor at a local university. The area where they lived was near a Taliban stronghold in the Haqqani Network, an insurgent group that the United States alleged had close ties to Al-Qaeda and Pakistan's ISI spy organization, had been staging attacks against government and NATO forces. So when they began to notice something was amiss outside of their home, outside of their compound, the family feared it might be a Taliban attack on their home. It was around 3.30 AM. As the celebration was winding down that the family and their guests noticed that the main light to the compound had been shut down by some outside party. Around that time, one of the musicians went into the courtyard to use the outhouse, and he saw lasers scoping the grounds from the perimeter. The man ran back inside and told the others. Daoud went out to see what was happening, Tahir told me. He thought the Taliban had come, that they were already on the roof. As soon as Daoud and his 15-year-old son, Sadiqula, stepped out into the courtyard, they were both hit by sniper rounds and fell to the ground. The family began hearing the voices of their attackers. Some were shouting commands in English, some and others in Pashtun. The family suspected the attackers were Americans. Panic broke out inside the house. All the children were shouting, Daoud is dead, Daoud is shot, Daoud is shot, Tahir recalled. Daoud's eldest son was behind his father and younger brother when they were hit. When my father went down, I screamed, he told me. Everybody, my uncles, the women, everybody came out of the home and ran into the corridors of the house. I sprinted to them and warned them not to come out as there were Americans attacking and they would kill them. Meanwhile, Daoud's brothers, Mohammed Zahir and Mohammed Saber, tried to come to his aid. When I ran outside, Daoud was laying here, Mohammed Saber told me as we stood in the dusty courtyard at the very spot where Daoud was shot. We carried Daoud inside. As Daoud lay bleeding out on the floor in a hallway inside the compound, his brother Sahar said he was going to try to stop the attack by speaking to the Americans. He was a local district attorney and knew some English. We work for the government, he shouted outside. Look at our police vehicles. You've wounded a police commander. Three women from the family, Bibi Salaiha, age 37, Bibi Shireen, age 22, and Gulali, aged 18, clutched at Zahar's clothes, pleading with him not to step outside. It didn't make a difference. Zahir was gunned down where he stood, with sniper rounds hitting him and the three women. Zahir, Bibi Saleha, and Bibi Shireen died quickly. Gulali and Daoud held on for hours, but their besieged family members could do nothing for them, and they eventually died from their injuries. Somehow, in a matter of minutes, a jubilant family event had become a massacre. Seven people had died in all, according to the family members. Two of the women had been pregnant. The women had 16 children among them. It was 7 a.m. A few hours earlier, Mohammed Saber had just seen his brother, his wife, his niece, and his sister-in-law gunned down. Now he stood shell-shocked above their corpses in a room filled with American soldiers. The mass commandos had burst into the home and proceeded to raid it, searching every room. Saber told me that Daoud and Gul Ali were still alive at that point. U.S. soldiers kept saying they would get the medical attention. They didn't let us take them to the hospital and kept saying that they have doctors and they would take care of the injured folks, he said. I kept asking them to let me take my daughter to the hospital because she had lost a lot of blood and we had a car right there, Mohammed Tahir Gulali's father recalled. But they didn't let me take her to the hospital. My daughter and Daoud were still alive. We kept asking, but we were told that a helicopter is coming and that our injured will be taken to the hospital. Both of them died before any helicopter came to retrieve them. Even as the American raid was underway, Mohammed Saber and his nephew Izzat, along with the wives of Daoud and Saber, prepared burial shrouds for those who had died. The Afghan custom involves binding the feet and head. A scarf secured around the bottom of the chin is meant to keep the mouth of the deceased from hanging open. They had managed to do this before the Americans began handcuffing them and dividing the surviving men and women into separate areas. Several of the male family members told me that it was around this time that they witnessed a horrifying scene. U.S. soldiers digging the bullets out of the women's bodies. They were putting knives into their injuries to take out the bullets, Saber told me. I asked him bluntly, you saw the Americans digging the bullets out of the women's bodies? Without hesitation, he said yes. Tahir told me he saw the Americans with knives standing over the bodies. They were taking out the bullets from their bodies to remove the proof of their crime, he said. Zoe Wickham. Probably unseemly to read fiction after that, but anyway, here goes. I'm reading from um, 
from a novel called David's Story, um, where I have two, um, two narratives uh, interwoven. The first is of David. It's 1994, and it's the story of David, who is an ex-commander in the military wing of the ANC. And the other, from which I'm going to read now, is of a minor Greek war chief at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. Um, Adam Koch the first begat Cornelius Koch the careless, who even after his death lost the diamond fields of Griqualand West, who begat Adam Koch the second, who begat Adam Koch the third, who more or less begat Adam Moise Koch, all without the interference of women, which was just as well or the staff of office bequeathed by the colonial government and responsibly passed on from generation to generation would undoubtedly have been sold by a faithless wife. But women, and complication, will intrude. And thus, Adam Maycock begat a daughter, Rachel Susanna, who, sitting on the knee of Captain Adam Cock III, listened to marvelous and greatly exaggerated stories about Natatisi, the giant Batlokwa warrior chieftainess, and Victoria, the small, fat, and cross British queen. <laughs> Bewitched by the child, the captain said, why not, if she were good and quiet and obedient, why not a female successor? Her father, Adam Mace, whose name in any case did not bode well, could keep an eye on things until she was ready to rule, to which the captain's chair-bound lady nodded vigorously. Having thrilled at the tales of female rule, she came to think of the child as her very own. When Adam Macecock, whilst leading the Griqua rebellion in 1878 against British annexation, was shot by a dashing high commissioner in a scarlet coat, old lady cock leapt more nimbly than her figure would allow out of her chair to assume the heavy staff of office, which despite the shaking of beards and grizzled heads, she held with a steadfast hand over her people. Rachel, Susanna Cock, growing up in the shadow of her aunt, forgot all about the destiny pronounced by the captain until she married none other than Andris Lefleur, the grandson of a queasy young Huguenot, Edouard Lefleur, whose limp linen-clad figure we have left in an earlier century insensible to the silver flying fish at the equator as he stood vomiting on the poop deck. <laughs> the rest of Edward's story can be found in Mrs. Sarah Gertrude Millen's narrative about miscegenation, although the reader should note that she has taken several liberties with the tale, including casting the boy as an Englishman and adding some years to his age. In other words, that her narrative is as unreliable as David's. On the autumn equinox of 1867, when Andres Lefleur shot headfast into the world, the cry of the departing stork was quite drowned by the scream of Oma Treda, the midwife. The good woman had once before delivered a called baby, years ago in Griqualand West, and that one's legendary powers of vision had not stood him in good stead. But such a call, like a stocking pulled tightly over the little one's head, as if he could not risk entering the world without a gorilla's disguise. A matrader's skillful scissors trembled as she removed the membrane. But like baby Jesus, the infant uttered not a single cry. Po-faced, like his implacable grandfather. She might as well have left him imprisoned in his call, for all he seemed to care about the world. Not that he was not alert. The mixture of Malayan, Madagascan slave blood, French missionary, and Khoisan hunter blood had produced a perfect blend of high cheekbones, bronze skin, and bright green arm and eyes that stared with such knowledge that his mother, whose name no one remembers, wept and turned away. The nameless woman trusted no one, not after the lies and the loss of land, the interminable trekking and the bad manners of the British who were supposed to be their saviors. As for expectation, well, she had learnt her lesson in Griqualand West. 
that it was only sensible to stand such a thing on its head and wait the opposite. No matter how old the legend of the call, the world was becoming horribly modern, and she would not believe that it would bring her son good luck. Against death by water, the midwife insisted. Sailors would give you anything for such a call. Now that's just the sort of good luck you need when you live miles inland, the mother retorted. Did I not see with my own eyes how you had to cut this blue-in-the-face baby out of captivity? And now look at him. The baby's old man eyes narrowed into points of green light, hard as diamonds. Bury the thing, and not a word to a sailor or anyone else, said the mother. Omar Trader had to agree. Classy Fortain, a first called child in Hope Town, could see right through the earth to where the diamonds lay glittering in the deep. And what fortune or hope did that bring him? led as he was by the collar, like a sniffer dog to show white people where to dig, and his pot children running around bare-bummed with nothing to eat. If anyone should ask about Andres's call, they would simply deny it. Andres, unlike other children, did not like playing with water. Some say that it stemmed from the day of his christening, when old Duomini Joshua's trembling finger missed the font. Insensible to moisture, the horny digit traced a perfectly dry cross on the baby's brow. <laughs> on reaching home, his mother, reading an omen in the accidental lack of water, gave him a sprinkling that even the indomitable infant could not withstand. His stylus eyes filled with a liquid that dispersed the light, his toothless mouth gaped once, twice, resisting before he gave in to a hearty wail. It was then, through snot and tears, that he heard the first voice. Fear neither water nor the absence of water. Listen to the waves lapping at Robben Island and look to the radical moisture of the desert where your Chrichriqua ancestors tended their stock. The voice that at first sounded incomprehensible was in fact in Chiri, the old Chrichua tongue, which then was spoken only by the older generation. That he was able to access the language came as no surprise. The mixing of blood may have been old hat in the melting pot of the cape. What the infant Le Fleur, Kirilla in arms, understood was that above the new roar of eugenics, the koi, oldest blood of all, spoke at once most clearly and in code and that the imperative, its preferred mood, made for its clicking clarity. Thank you. Stephen Adley Girgis. Hello. This is... Uh it really is amazing. It really is amazing. Um, I would, uh, I, I would like to um, uh, read uh, a portion of a, of a scene uh, called uh, from a play called In Arabia We'd All Be Kings, and then I'd like to read uh, uh, a short or uh, a monologue from another play called Jesus Hop the H.A. Um, so, uh, uh, this play is set in a bar um, in Times Square uh, before it was gentrified. Um, and, uh, and before the people and the, and the places were removed. Um, so there's, there's three characters. There's, uh, there's um, Skank, who's a, a junkie and uh, a hustler, who's but a little bit past his you know, uh, Prime, and his girlfriend, who's also an addict, who's a hooker named Chicky, and then there's a, a guy named Greer who uh, comes in the bar, and he's kind of slumming. Um, and so, uh, I'll read a little bit of it. Um, where does it start? Yeah, okay. So, uh, Greer says, <clears throat> it was different then. I get you, man. You getting him there, Chicky? He's talking about it was different then. 
Now, I got a friend, Franklin. I call him up Friday night. And this is important. It's Friday night, okay? Friday night. Not Monday, Friday. Oh, I need a drink. Barman, I'll have another one, please, with a twist. This is not a twist. This is a wedge. Twist good, wedge bad, okay? You want a drink? Sure. Barman, one for him. Uh, how about Chicky? Can she have one, too? She looks a little young. Uh, people say I look young, but then when they see me up close, they say I don't look so young as they thought I was before they saw me up close. Right, fine, whatever, give her a drink. So anyway, I call up my friend Franklin. Franklin, it's been so long, blah, blah, blah. I miss you, I miss you too. We should get together. I was just thinking of you, la, 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 la. So I say, where are you going out tonight? Now, let me tell you something about Franklin. Back in the day, if you wanted a party, just look for Franklin. Because I don't care if it's the deadest night of the week, if you find Franklin, you're going to find a party and a damn good one, too. I'm talking about the Fun House, Peppermint Lounge, the old danceteria. I'm talking about the limelight when the limelight was the limelight. I'm talking about Studio 54. I'm talking about doing blow with Mick Jagger and Miss Liza Minnelli till 8 a.m. in the back of the limo, and someone's grabbing on you, you, knew, you know what, and someone's got someone's tongue and someone's something, and everyone is feeling it. You hear what I'm saying? It's a fucking party. Oh, Lord, have mercy, but it was. So I says to Franklin, I says, what you doing tonight, girl? He says, I swear to God, if I'm lying, I'm dying. He says, well, Greer, I'm making a pot of tea and watching the Blue Lagoon. I said, Creature from the Blue Lagoon? He said, no, Brooke Shields and Christopher Atkins' Blue Lagoon. I said, come on, girl, turn off that TV. Let's do it like we used to. He starts talking about AA this, jogging that, and do I want to go to a meeting? You hear what I'm saying? That's rough, man. Motherfucker started talking about the Lord. You feeling me? Shit. I mean, when a man starts talking about the Lord, well, I was raised Baptist. I have heard absolutely all I need to ever hear about the damn Lord. You want to talk to me about the Lord? You better be the damn Lord. Otherwise, just get out of my my kitchen girl because breakfast is definitely over. I mean, am I wrong? Nah, man. I mean, everybody I know is the same shit. A, A, N, A, D, A, G, A, name any fucking A. I'll show you a motherfucker falling for it. You know, they got a support group for people who think they're getting too much sex. I mean, please. Have you ever known a man, gay, straight, whatever, have you ever had anybody ever come up to you talking about, Oh, man, I'm just getting too much booty. And the more booty I get, the more miserable I am. Nigga, please. Oh, it's ridiculous. It's depressing is what it is. Used to be, you take work, for instance. Everyone could go out, have a good time. Now, shit, these assholes I work with, all they want to do is drink one light beer and or one faggot spritz and go home and shave their damn bodies and pump iron and eat alfalfa sprouts and meditate and watch that damn Callista Flockhart skinny bitch show. You ever seen that show? <laughs> ah, fuck that show, man. I'll tell you right now, I never saw the show and I never will. I got better things to do with my time than watch some skinny bitch being a skinny bitch. Pardon my language, but that's how I feel. And I don't need the Lord to tell me how to feel or what to watch. And Christopher Atkins, notwithstanding, I will eat a damn pussy before I stay home on Friday night making tea and watching the damn Blue Lagoon. Oh, I need a drink and I need a smoke because I'm working up a sweat here. What you smoking? <laughs> the scene gets really, that's like the fun part of the scene. Then it gets kind of bad. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, just a, a monologue, basically, from uh, Jesus Hop the A-Chain. In this, basically, this scene, there's uh, um, an older prisoner who's a, uh, um, what's it called? Not a psychotic, uh, a crazy-ass serial killer, a sociopathic <laughs> serial killer who's awaiting extradition to Florida where he killed eight people. Um, in prison, he's, he's found God. Um, and there's another prisoner. Um, they're on a 23-hour lockdown, so they have an hour today, uh, an hour a day in these cages up on uh, on the roof. And there's this other young prisoner who's just gotten in, who's very green and very terrified. And so the older prisoner, Lucius, um, gets it into his head that if he can minister and save this younger inmate, then he in turn will be saved. Um, as the play goes on, what happens to Lucius is he still gets extradited to Florida. He realizes he's going to die, and he abandons all the religious shit. Because unfortunately, well, this is a whole conversation about sociopath personalities. But anyway, this is Lucius trying to minister to this, to this kid, Angel. So he says, uh, 
Okay, so listen careful. There I was, Miami Beach, paradise, right? Little apartment uh, complex they got over there, second floor, view of the ocean, the ladies, everything. The ladies down in Miami Beach, Angel, mm, like nobody's business, brother. Awesome, incredible. Rent was cheap, didn't pay but 400 bucks a month on the little place. Did I mention it had a little terrace? Well, it did. Never went out on it. Cocaine in Florida? Plentiful, Jack. Extremely plentiful and cheap. Real cheap. Dirt cheap. For all intents and purposes, the shit was free. Pardon my language, but that's what cocaine is. Shit. Horse shit. Anyway, oh, and them quaaludes, them little 714s, like, take an aspirin, baby. Take two, call me late for dinner. Heroin, Dilaudid, just pick up the phone. 30 minutes, home delivery. Hated the sun, though. Hated it. I'm not talking about, gee, I wish it wasn't so sunny. I'm talking hate. Pathological Dracula shit. Deep. Come a time, I stopped going to work if it was too sunny. Used to call in sick, order a pizza and a 12 pack for 850. How you gonna beat that? Delivery boy, he was all right, little Ecuadorian kid, used to pick me up a little something on the way, nice bag, couple of pornos, whatever I wanted. Used to come blow a little smoke with him, he'd leave happy. Nice little system. One day he stopped by, I killed him. Killed him with a cowboy boot. I mean, I was wearing the boot at the time. That, that's how I killed him. But after I killed him, I didn't know what to do, so I chop him up and I throw him in the dumpster right next door. Next door. Can you imagine that? And you know what happened? Nothing. Not a damn thing. Kept waiting for the sirens. They never came. So I called up the pizza shop, told them, I never got my pizza. You know what they did? They sent me another one for free. Now, to me, that's a peculiar turn of events, don't you think? Unnatural. And I'll tell you why I killed him. I killed him because he left the door open, said the place stunk, needed some air. But when the air came in, the sun came with it. Now, I think. I think that was a very unusual thing for me to do, killing that boy. Don't you? Highly unusual. And nothing happened. Nothing. One day I finally got up the gumption to leave Miami, but by then I had killed five people. Five. Killed three more up north over here, but they was all white. Funny how people start paying attention when white folks start chopping. And all of this, because I hated the sun. My enemy, the sun. I had everything in the world down there, but I didn't have nothing. Now I got nothing, but I got everything. I love the sun now. Love it. Before, hate. Now, love. That's a conundrum, Kimasabi. <laughs> when you get back to your cell, don't lie down. When you can't do nothing except lie down, then you're gonna lie down, dig on what I just told you. Reflect. Every hour, I'm gonna bang my, wall, my, my, my hand on the wall three times. Let you remember you ain't alone, okay? Yeah. Whoa, 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 hold up. Today's Monday, right? Is it? Yeah, yeah, don't take that soup. You'll be up all night. Thank you. Adina Hoffman. <clears throat> to think that the sun rose in the east, that men and women were flexible, real, alive, that everything was alive, to think that you and I did not see, feel, think, nor bear our part, to think that we are now here, and bear our part. That is Walt Whitman, um, a poem called To Think of Time. And this is me. Um, the, the book is from, this is from My Happiness Bears No Relation to Happiness. The house is dark in the February damp, but when she opens the door to let me in, Imnizar is laughing. 
It seems to tickle her that I got lost on my way to the home she almost never leaves, and that after driving in confused loops around a dingy Nazareth neighborhood where teenagers tinker with half-stripped cars and packs of chickens scuttle, I gave up, pulled to the side, and called to ask for help. In fact, Imnizar appears to be giggling or at least grinning much of the time. The still girlish planes of her grandmotherly face opened out into a permanent amused high beam. And though she's sneezing and coughing today as she greets me in her long terry cloth robe and two cardigan sweaters, her head swathed in a loosely knotted wool scarf, she waves me over the threshold and into the chill of the large living room with such insistent good cheer. Ahlein, ahlein! The standard welcome transformed in her full-throated delivery into a kind of credo. I feel like a traveler returning home after a long and arduous journey. Never mind the fact that my trip is really just beginning. This morning, I packed myself and my new tape recorder into a shiny rental car and trundled westward then north from Jerusalem, past the year's first almond blossoms, and toward this frigid room in Bir el Amir, the well of the prince, the Nazareth neighborhood where Taha Muhammad Ali and his family have lived for more than 20 years. The approach to this house always entails a subtle recalibration, a gentle, almost unconscious readjustment of one's pulse and gaze. In this case, the gnawing drive I've just taken through the traffic-clogged center of the country and into congested downtown Nazareth began to fall away when I at last regained my bearings and turned down the steep hill that leads into the neighborhood. Not that the scene there was in any way pastoral or uplifting. The entry is marked by an ugly clot of concrete apartment buildings painted in fading shades, tan, cream, sickly yellowish and gray, one with a pink confectionery stripe around the side and each with laundry flapping. Despite the obvious crowding that this knot of structures implies, the place is always oddly quiet. Olive trees and vegetable gardens interrupt the cement at sudden intervals, and several forgotten-looking construction sites have themselves become prolific beds of plush grass and wildflower. For all the years I have known Taha, the space across the street from his house has been dominated by the skeleton of a massive apartment building to be, and this unfinished monstrosity, with its abandoned cement mixers and heaps of litter-strewn dirt, has by now almost come to seem a natural feature of the landscape, like a cliff face or ancient boulder. Taha's own house is something else altogether. In the context of this dreary block, the first sign that one is now in the proximity of serious imagination. Invisible from the road, the driveway leads into the heart of a thick grove, really a small forest of fruit trees. Orange, lemon, grapefruit, olive, pomegranate, fig, pecan, and tangerine, pomela, and almond, and more olive, all planted close. Prickly pear, rose, jasmine, oleander, geranium, potato vine, chicory, daisy, and narcissus also cram the plot, as do swarms of apparently ecstatic blackbirds and sparrows. Though I knew from past visits that this lush and singular orchard awaited me, emerald city-like, at the end of my drive, all the foliage and sweet scent and bird song surprised me today nonetheless. The effect was at once stirring and calming. I would be content to sit in this thicket of color all day, but it is Taha who I've come to see, and after making my way up the bougainvillea-drenched staircase to the second floor entrance and being whisked indoors by the laughing M. Nizar, Taha's wife, I am ushered without much pomp into the bedroom, the only heated space in the house where Taha is lying down. And now it is my turn to laugh at the sight of him, prone in a puffy, full-length, quilted robe of gold-tinted synthetic leopard skin with long purple tassels and a two-inch thick calico lining. My children call it Gorbachev, Taha announces <laughs> a bit cryptically, then explains with mock grandeur that the garment is Circassian, a gift from a friend after Taha tripped and broke his leg in the living room a few months earlier, and the doctor ordered him after an operation to stay warm. He wears it today over an old running suit and with his usual black pancake cap tilted at a rakish angle, and though his outfit is absolutely ridiculous, it does, in its peculiar way, suit him. Equal parts clown and king. Um, I should say I was there that day for um, a complicated set of reasons, some of which um, were plain to me at the time and some of which only became clear later, but all of which amounted to the fact that I had basically decided or sort of felt myself compelled to write the life and times of this man, pal the Palestinian poet Taha Muhammad Ali. Um, it was in many ways a completely insane thing to do. Um, Taha was not and is not to this day a household name in, even in Arabic speaking circles. Um, 
to try and tell his story to English language readers who know very little of Palestinian culture and even less about Arabic literature um, was going to be a serious challenge, to say the least. Um, and Taha came from a village called Safuria um, in the Galilee, which Israel demolished in the wake of the 1948 war. Um, and most of his poems, almost all of his poems, well up from the ground of that bulldozed place, um, which is to say that most of the history I would be attempting to recount had, had been buried, um, if not completely erased. Uh, and when you add to that the fact of who I am, a Jew um, who carries two passports, one American, one Israeli, um, it may sound vaguely delusional, um, but I, st I still felt compelled to try. Um, given the cultural and political climate that we were living in, um, it seemed critical to at least try. Um, or as I put it in the book. One of the questions that I'm eager to answer as I grapple with Taha's life and its times concerns his unlikely exuberance. I have seen so many people on both sides of the ostensible Palestinian-Israeli divide become sour, depressed, shrill, stunted. A land that devours its inhabitants is the eerily dead-on biblical diagnosis. How, I have wondered, despite everything that Taha has endured, does he manage to remain so alert and joyful? If he has been angry, and his poetry acknowledges that at times he has, he has not let this anger flare into hatred, but has turned it into an art and a generosity of feeling that, almost, that seem almost to defy history and maybe geography as well. His poetry has come to embody the essence of this place, addressing as it does the most difficult and painful dimensions of what is known as the conflict. At the same time, it also reaches far beyond these, these borders to speak both to those who know the land intimately and to those on the opposite ends of the earth. It is profoundly local and utterly universal. As Taha himself once explained, in my poetry there is no Palestine, no Israel, but there are suffering, sadness, longing, fear, and these together make Palestine and Israel. Um, so once I had decided um, to attempt to account for that um, exuberance of his, I still had my work cut out for me. Um, and I'll end with this. Venturing to reconstruct the years of Taha's childhood and adolescence, or to imagine Safaria in all its vanished richness and complication is a daunting task. And as I work, interviewing, translating, and transcribing those interviews, sifting through archival files, combing footnotes and card catalogs, Xeroxing, looping microfilm onto spools, pouring through old journals and newspapers, I sometimes feel myself an archaeologist, entrusted with an especially precious but partial and vulnerable to the elements mound of chipped relics and fragmented memories, each of which must be examined and gingerly placed in a pattern that makes some kind of sense. There are obstacles. Safaria was an almost entirely oral place, and written documentation of the village of the sort biographers tend to take for granted when constructing timelines and portraits of their subjects simply does not exist. The village had no local newspaper, no records office, no medical files, no school yearbook. None of Taha's relatives or friends kept date books or diaries or wrote newsy letters to out-of-town aunts. His mother hung no smiling wedding pictures from her walls, and she did not memorialize her children's growth in a scrapbook or photo album. And whatever private papers of Taha's that might once have existed, his report cards, his first attempts at writing, the, singular, the single photograph taken of him as a child, were destroyed when the village was destroyed. The only paper trail left by the village is a thin, fascinating, and distinctly misleading one, which passes through archives now housed in Eng Israel and England. These records provide a glimpse into the life of the village that is, on the one hand, marvelously concrete, not precarious and shifting like memory, and so an exciting discovery for someone trying to rebuild the village, as it were, on the page. The tabletop-sized Mandate-era Nazareth District police station logs that have survived the years, for instance, offer the most tangible facts about the people and pulse of the village, who bullied who, who cheated who, who beamed who over the head with a rock at exactly what hour on what day. But as these few examples indicate, and as logic dictates, the only sort of events that are preserved in the law enforcement files are the grumbling, ugly ones. This is merely a story of grievances and arrests. And though the tale told by these records is no doubt true and important to account for somehow as one tries to conjure the village, it also leaves out the contented, day in, day out, uncomplaining side of Safaria. And according to the people who lived there, this was the place they knew and loved. Thank you.
first reader tonight, James Salter. Uh, Philip Bowman, uh, in his 20s, he's an editor uh, at a small publishing house in New York, met a, a girl from, uh, who lived in Washington named Vivian, and uh, fell madly in love with her. And uh, this is uh, a part when he takes her home to meet his mother. He's very interested in her. Before that, the Virginia of Vivian Amison was Anglo, privileged, and inbred. It was made up of rolling wooded country, beautiful country, rich at heart, with low stone walls and narrow roads that had preserved it. The old houses were stone and often one room deep so the windows on both sides could be opened and allow a breeze to come through in the hot summers. Originally, the land had been given in royal grants, huge tracts before the revolution, and put to farming, tobacco first and then dairy. In the 1920s or 30s, Paul Mellon, who liked to hunt, came and bought great amounts of land, and friends joined him and bought places for themselves. It became a country for horses and hunts, the hounds baying in disorders as they ran, while after them from around the trees came the galloping horses and their riders jumping stone walls and ditches, uphill and down, slowing a little, galloping again. It was a place of order and style, the kingdom, from Middleburg to Upperville, a place and life of part, much of it intensely beautiful, the broad fields soft in the rain or gentle and bright in the sun. In the spring were the races, the gold cup in May, over the steeplechase hills, the crowd distractedly watching from the rows of parked cars with food and drink laid out. In the fall were the hunts that went on into the winter until February when the ground was hard and the streams frozen. Everyone had dogs. If you had named a hound, he or she was yours when no longer needed for the hunt. In fact, the dog would be dumped at your door. The fine houses belonged to the rich and to doctors, and the estates, farms as they were called, retained their old names. People knew one another. Those they did not know, they regarded with suspicion. They were white, Protestant, with an unstated tolerance for a few Catholics. <laughs> In the houses, the furniture was English and often antique, passed down through the family. It was horses and golf. You made your best friends in sport. They go to Summit, which is Bowman's town, to meet his mother. Beatrice had been eager to meet her and was also struck by her looks, though in a different way, the freshness and naked animal statement. How much one knows from the first. She had bought flowers and set the table in the dining room where they seldom ate, usually using a table in the kitchen, one end of which was against the wall. The kitchen, with shelves but no cabinets, was the real heart of the house, together with the sitting room, where they often sat in front of the fireplace, talking and having a drink. Now, was, now there was this girl with somewhat stiff manners. She was from Virginia. And Beatrice asked, what part, Middleburg? Well, we really, live, we really live nearer to Upperville, Vivian replied. Upperville. 
It sounded rural and small. It was, in fact, small. There was one place to eat, but no town water or sewage. Nothing had changed there for 100 years, and people there liked it that way, whether they lived in an old house without heat or in a 1,000 acres. Upperville, in the country and beyond, was an exalted name, the emblem of a proud parochial class of which Vivian was a member. You could not stay there. You had to live there. <laughs> it's beautiful country, Bone explained. Beatrice said, I'd love to see it. What does your family do there? Farm, Vivian said. <laughs> well, my father farms some, but he also puts his fields up for grazing. It must be big. Oh, it's not terribly big. It's about 400 acres. That's so interesting. Apart from farming, what is there to do? <laughs> Daddy always says there's lots to do. He means looking after the horses. Horses, yes. It's not that she was difficult to talk to, <laughs> but you immediately felt the limits. Vivian had gone to junior college, probably at the suggestion of her father to keep her out of mischief. She had a certain confidence based on the things she absolutely knew and which had proved to be enough. Like all mothers, like all mothers though, Beatrice hoped for a girl like herself with whom she could speak easily and whose view of life could perfectly be combined with her own. Among her pupils over the years, she could think of girls who were like that, good students with natural charm that you admired and were drawn to. But there were also others not so easily understood and whose fate you were not meant to know. Didn't Liz Bohannon come from Middleburg, Beatrice asked bringing up a name, a horse and society figure of the 30s, always photographed with her husband aboard some ship sailing to Europe or in their box at Saratoga. Yes, yeah, she has a big place. She's a friend of my father's. She's still around, oh, very much around. <laughs> there are a lot of stories about her, Vivian said. When they first bought their place, Longtree, that was the name then, she used to ride in from the hunt and let the dogs come right into the house. They'd jump up on the table and eat everything. <laughs> After she got divorced, she calmed down a bit. <laughs> oh, you must know her then. Oh, yes. Vivian was eating somewhat carefully, not like a girl with a genuine appetite. <laughs> the flowers which Beatrice had moved to the side were a lush backdrop for her, some young pagan goddess who cast a spell over her son. Though it wasn't entirely a spell, Beatrice had no way to measure how much in need of love he was and what forms that took. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was absolutely certain of one thing, that he would never meet someone like Vivian again. He saw himself tumbled with her among the bedclothes and fragrance of married life, the meals and holidays of it, the shared rooms, the glimpses of her half-dressed, her blondness, the pale hair where her legs met, the sexual riches that would be there forever. <clears throat> when he told his mother he hoped to marry her, Beatrice, though afraid it would prove nothing, protested how unlike the two of them were, how little they had in common. They had a great deal in common, Bowman a little defiantly said. What they had in common was more vital than similar interests. It was wordless understanding and accord. What Beatrice did not say, but what she deeply felt, was that Vivian had no soul, but to say it would be unforgivable. 
She merely sat silent. After a moment, she said, I hope you won't rush into anything. In her heart, she feared. In her heart, she feared. She knew the things you cannot see when you are too young. She hoped that with a little time, the infatuation would pass. She could only press his head against her in love and understanding. I only want you to be happy, truly happy. I would be truly happy. I mean in your deepest heart. Yes, in my deepest. It was love, the furnace into which everything is dropped. <laughs> Thank you.